guess we'll get on our subject tonight. So I've asked Pastor Paul to come and talk about uh, end times, because I am definitely not an expert on that. But um, yes, like I said, if you guys have any questions, mm-hmm. uh, we're just going to go over what we believe about end times and uh, any whatever direction we want to go tonight, we're just going to leave it open. So. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, this happens to be my favorite subject. Okay. Um, I've actually studied it in depth since the year 2000. So that's this is, this is 22 years. Um, literally, I mean, <clears throat> some pastors, their hobby is playing golf. Uh, some, it's, I don't know, playing tennis or whatever. But mine is end times. Uh, I get a kick out of it. I get a buzz out of it. I could write for days. I mean, I just, I love digging deep. I love going into the Greek. I love going into the Hebrew. I love looking at the Old Testament. I love looking at new. I like dissecting the engine when it gets to Revelation. Uh, has anybody ever read through the whole book of Revelation here? Anybody from Revelation 1 to Revelation 22? Anybody? Two. Oh. Well, why do people avoid Revelation? Oh, oh Jojo as well. Huh? Okay, why, why do most people avoid Revelation? I mean, who's read anything in Revelation? Okay, so what's your thoughts? What's your feedback? What you've read? Confusing. Confusing. Confusing? Okay, anybody else? In depth, that's for sure. In depth? It's intense? It's like figurative. Yeah, you see, I think the reason people... Um, people avoid it is because of the way it's written. You know, it's written and it's called, like, the word, the Greek word for a revelation is apocalypse, okay? So it's written in apocalyptic language. An apocalyptic language isn't, like, necessarily how we would normally talk. Um, so because it's apocalyptic, we kind of just get freaked out and we that, we say, oh, that's not for us, that's for the pastor, that's for someone who studied it 22 years. But honestly, the one thing about Revelation, it says there's a blessing for those who read it. There's a blessing for those who hear hear it. So I would advise you, as you kind of feel more comfortable, uh, to dive into it. But for years, I kind of struggled with it. And then I decided to do this. I decided to leave Revelation to the side and literally for six months i wasn't going to look near revelation and i started to read genesis to jude because i'm like this seems a lot easier to read than revelation Mm -hmm. so i'm like what happens is people dive into revelation Mm -hmm. and then they start speculating well they these ten horns mean this and these seven heads mean this and before they know it they're like their their head spinning so i don't propose that you start in revelation I would go to the clearest passages you know in the Bible that you that talk about the coming of the Lord, whatever, and see what's clear and then move to the difficult passages. Um, so there is a multitude of views out there in end times. Does anybody know any of the main views out there today? Or what is the main view in America today? Tribulation. Pre-trib. Pre-trib. Who's heard of pre-trib? Okay. okay. I heard left behind. Left behind. Yeah, I was near left behind tonight. My w- wife ran away with a car. <laughs> okay. Um, so, left behind. Who's heard of the Left Behind series? <laughs> Anybody watched the movies or read a book on Left Behind? <laughs> okay. So, um, I would say that's the most popular view in America today. Would you agree? I mean, anybody that's... Uh, uh, most churches actually, if you're not a pre-tribber, you can't actually be a member of that church, which to me is ridiculous. Um, in our church, we do not, even though there's, we have strong beliefs, whatever, on end times, we do not make it a condition that you must believe everything 100% that we do to be a member. Uh, I, I don't believe that's fair. I believe that's kind of manipulating people. And it's not giving them enough room to say, you know what, um, you know, I don't, I don't agree with that there, but I, this is what I think. So surely if we believe in religious freedom and liberty, surely we can be flexible when it comes to end times. Mm-hmm. You know, not just try and brainwash everybody to be what we believe. 
So really, in many ways, I feel the more developed we get as a church, rather than teaching what, what we believe, um, uh, John MacArthur does this, what we teach. That's what he calls it, what we teach. Because there's people in John MacArthur's church mightn't believe everything that he believes. So I think that's pretty smart, what we teach. Um, because that, that allows people, well, I know Pastor Paul teaches this, but maybe I believe this. Especially when it comes to the subject of end times. Um, so the main, the most popular um, position in America today since about the early 1900s is pre-trib. Before that, the main view in America was the view that I would hold to. So I've done a little chart here, okay? So it's really brief and simple. So this is basically what we teach, okay, as a church. That this is the beginning. This is a cross. So there's approximately 4,000 years in here. Then there's 2,000 years plus in here and still running. So basically our view is this is the cross. This is when Jesus comes and we rise to meet him. This is the end. Okay? So the end. Benito. It's all over. You're either saved or lost, caught up or caught on. Mm -hmm. um, and we move from time into eternity. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and at this point, everybody is resurrected, believers and unbelievers, and everybody is judged. Okay, so Jesus puts the sheep on which side? The right or the left? Right. Sheep on the right, the goats are on the left. They are all before the same throne at the same time. So how is he separating them if they're like... Um, so let's go to this view. This is the most popular view today. But this used to be the most popular view in America when people knew their Bibles. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most Christians, I'm telling you, if you start to get them to explain this, most of them can't explain it. And I have had people in this church, uh, they were belonged to another church, and they said, right, we want you to talk to our pastor. Uh, we want to know why this is the right way or that is the right way. Well, the last time that happened was... Um, uh, we met at Stir Fry. Anybody ever been to Stir Fry in Sioux City? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So I met at Stir Fry. Um, this guy said, this is Pastor Blah Blah. This is Pastor Blah Blah. And I want to see what's the right view here. And he just let us loose. So after five minutes, I actually had, I used to believe this view, by the way, whenever I was young. I actually had to help him explain this view because he couldn't even explain it himself. <laughs> and the reason is it's so confusing because there, here we believe that there's two peoples in this world. What's the two peoples in this world? Saved and lost. Saved and lost. Mm -hmm. That's what we believe. Here, how many peoples do they believe there is in the world? Three. Three. You've got the church believers, you've got the ungodly, and then you've got Israel. So... Israel, they're like, they're too righteous to be wicked, but they're too wicked to be righteous. <laughs> okay? Now, don't, don't get me to explain it because they can't even explain it, okay? Um, so, I'm just telling you, this is such a simple view, but simplicity alone doesn't make it right. But the, the view is that whenever it comes to here, you're either saved or else you're lost. Okay? With this view... Um, Whenever Jesus comes, then what happens is there's a rapture or a secret rapture, and we, the church, disappear. And suddenly everybody the next day is wondering, where's McKenna went? McKenna's not at school, whatever. Uh, where's Cameron? The cows are having calves here, and Cameron's not here to, to do the calves. So, okay? And everybody's wondering, what's happened? Okay? And then for seven years then, some say... They split the seven years into three and a half. The first three and a half they think is pretty calm. And they um, <coughs> some think the next three and a half is really absolutely hell and earth. Other people believe the seven years is total hell and earth. So we're up here in heaven, 
Israel is then, and they're left behind here, but they end up getting saved in here. And then anybody who misses the boat here, they've got seven years to get into the boat, okay? Now, if in the seven years they, they don't get right, then there's a third coming, okay? So there's a third coming where this time Jesus comes down and he brings his church with him, okay? So after seven years in heaven, he comes back down. Then there's another thousand years. People are still dying in here. People are still having children in here. Um, you can still get saved in here. So basically, if you miss the first boat, you get the second boat. And then after that, you've got eternity after that. So this to me is very, very complicated. Um, it, I don't. The other thing is this. And here's the $64 million question that I've been asking for 22 years. And this is a question you could ask somebody who believes this. Can you show me anywhere in the Bible, anywhere, that teaches there's going to be a rapture of the church? Uh, what does the word rapture mean? Anybody? I mean... I don't know. Okay, so the, in First Thessalonians chapter 4, it talks about that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Okay, the word rapture is not in the Bible, so I don't really like to use it. But if I'm talking about their view, I use it just so people know what I'm talking about. So um, basically, these are the two main views um, in America throughout the world. This used to be, if you go back to the Reformation, uh, even right back to the early church, the early church, the Catholic church, the Protestant Reformation, um, the Calvinists, the Arminianists, everybody who believed whatever, the Wesleys, you had the Wesleys and the Whitfields, uh, you come right through to about 1830. Okay? So this is a big date. 1830. Right through to there, this was the overwhelming view within the church. I mean, the, the Reformers, the Covenanters, the Puritans, those who wrote the King James Bible were Puritans, the English Puritans, and the Scottish Covenanters. Them guys did their daily readings in Greek and Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So they knew their stuff. But they all held to this view here. Basically, like I could teach Luke, my nine-year-old son. So if somebody said to me, explain the coming of the Lord to your son Luke, I guarantee you I could do that within two minutes. When Jesus comes, that's it. It's over. Finito. You're either ready or you're not ready. If you're ready, you go to be with the Lord forever and ever. If you're not ready, you're going to be damned and judged in the lake of fire forever and ever. Would you agree? It's not hard to teach that. So, there you are. That's it. So, um, what I'm saying is this view is so simple, but it's so right. Um, this view here... I asked that pastor in stir fry, I, I pushed him several times, can you give me the passage that teaches, um, I, I had to actually give him his proof text. I, so I had to tell him that his proof texts were Daniel 9, 1 Thessalonians 4, and also Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Um, so, um, I'd like to leave it open for questions tonight, because listen, we could go, we could talk about Antichrist tonight. We could talk about the last days. What, what's the signs of the last days? Uh, we, could, um, we could actually go into, let, have a look at the resurrection passages that prove that it all happens at the one time. Or judgment passages that say it all happens at the one time. So I literally have come prepared tonight for any questions on any subject. There's no stupid questions tonight. And, or even if you want to go into Revelation, or if you say to me, Show me their view in Revelation. Where do they get their view? And let me judge for myself. I can, I can teach their view for you if you want. If you want me to... The, um, who, is, who is aware... Who was brought up with a pre-trip teaching? Anybody? Me? Yeah? I knew about it, but I never really believed it. Yeah. I mean, it, it is probably the most popular view. But, I mean, if, you've, if you want to even put counter-arguments to me and say, okay, here's my problem with this position here. Or, can you show me how that it's time and then it's eternity? Because this is big. To me, I believe that time stops when he comes. Yeah. But does time stop here? 
It can't because the clock, you still need your watch. Yeah. There's another seven years. You need calendars. And after this, do you still need your watch? Yeah. Okay, because people are still dying in here. There's still funerals. There's still babies been born. They're still crying. There's dying and crying. There's war and terror. Because guess how this year ends up after the thousand years? Anybody know how the thousand years end up? What, what happens at the end of the thousand years? Anybody? Fire from heaven falls. No. What happens is, okay, so the devil is bound for a thousand years. Okay. Then the devil is released. Think about this. A thousand years after Jesus comes, a thousand and seven years after Jesus comes, then the devil suddenly gets released out of his prison. Do you, do you want me to hold that mic close to me? No, it's not the mic. It's just your marker. Huh? Here you go. Huh? Try that one. Okay. If it's anything, okay. If it's anything. So after a thousand years, there we go. I mean, think about this. Jesus has come in all his majesty and glory. Then you've got a seven years of hell here on earth. Mm -hmm. Then you have a thousand years of peace. Like they say, oh, it's going to be bliss. And then after everybody, the lion and the lambs lying down together and they're wagging their tails mm -hmm. and everything's honky-dory. <laughs> uh, they don't, they don't kind of tell you, but um, the, they start off, they start the blood sacrifices off again in a thousand years. And they say that what happens is um, in Jerusalem, Jesus comes back here. Okay, let me redo this. Here, Jesus comes back to the Mount of Olives. And then what happens is the temple is rebuilt in Jerusalem. And then they start the blood sacrifices again for a thousand years. So here's Jesus. Jesus is in the temple. And he has to watch over for a thousand years as they start they rebuild the temple. They start the animal sacrifices. They restore the old priesthood. And they're all going through the same old, same old. Like, and here's us in our glorified bodies. So we're all in our glorified bodies. And yet there's billions of people in their mortal bodies. So they're running about and they're dying in their mortal bodies. And we've got immortal bodies. So we're all interacting. And then at the end, it says there's an uprising. So at the drop of a hat, the devil's released here after a thousand years. And then for a little season in here, billions of people follow the devil in this millennium. Billions. It says like the sand of the sea. Mm -hmm. That they all rise up against us. So we're running about in our glorified <laughs> eternal bodies. And there's all these jerks trying to fight Jesus and us in our glorified bodies. Like, honestly, it's a load of baloney. Yeah. If you think that that's going to... To me, and... I, I don't mind, hey, I don't mind counter arguments here, but there's nothing about this makes sense to me. Let me tell you, something happened when Jesus died. He removed our sin. He removed the need for animal sacrifices. And what happened was, what happened, okay, this happened in AD, AD 30. What happened... Uh, 40 years later in A.D. 70. Anybody know what happened in Jerusalem? Anybody know? Something ginormous happened in A.D. 70, which Jesus predicted. Did the, the temple, temple get destroyed? Yes. Okay. Now, guys, this is important. This is very important because, I mean, why did he not just destroy the temple right away? Well, tell me this, whenever he gave up the ghost, so Jesus is dying on the cross and it says he gave up the ghost. What happened at the moment he gave up the ghost and he breathed his last breath? Anybody know? Right, down at the temple, the curtain actually literally ripped in two. And they say, a lot of the commentators say that, that curtain was six foot thick. It was so thick because behind that curtain was a holy of holies. So that there separated the people from the priest. And the priest was only qualified to go behind that curtain once a year with a blood sacrifice for Israel. But the moment Jesus gave up the ghost, he tore that curtain. Once the curtain was ripped, the temple was basically useless. But he allowed 40 years. To me, the, the reason why he gave 40 years is just a sign of his grace. 
He gave them 40 years to adjust from, from the old covenant to the new covenant. Yeah. He could have destroyed it right away. But 40 years is a generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, and he gave them, a, and it's also the number for probation, 40 years to, for them to catch on. Mm -hmm. And it just tells me God's very gracious. Because yeah. it must have been hard moving from this to this here. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. So, I, I put it to you that, but that there was pivotal. Why would he start all this stuff again when he was the final sacrifice for sin? I mean, what is the purpose of starting like a slaughter of, of animals, innocent lambs, innocent goats, just butchering them for a thousand years? Exactly. And we're there in our glorified bodies all going about and having to watch this, this circus go on. Um, so I'm just telling you, I obviously have very strong views on this subject, but I'm open if somebody's got questions tonight or if you want us, if you want us to dig a little bit deeper in any subject. And I've also got, um, I've got um, print eyes tonight, but I'm kind of a bit worried. Sometimes what happens if you give these out, people start to read them and then it, we kind of lose the flow. So um, maybe you've a question about end times you've always wanted to ask. Um, maybe you, you you have an argument and you say, hey, I I'd, I kind of struggle with what you just said or whatever. Please, I mean, please feel free tonight to ask whatever. Anybody want to start us off with a question, a thought? Go ahead. Sorry. What um, uh, scripture in, in, in the Bible leads, the, leads people to... Okay. Um, do you want me to take you to the passages, or you know, some of the key passages that the pre-tribbers would use? Um, okay. So let's go to First Thessalonians chapter four. Huh? Is that right? I was looking at what glad tidings like they believe in the rapture, and like in their statement of faith, and one of their verses. Okay, so hey, hey, it's a good place to start. Now, let's have a little game between us, okay? So, they they are. This is one of their proof texts, okay? So, a proof text is they say this here proves the bottom part, okay? Now, you guys can judge tonight. So, I'm saying to you that First Thessalonians four, and if you keep going into First Thessalonians five, because there was no chapters in the original. Um, I put it to you, if we read 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, it's going to prove the top part. Um, you guys can judge. So they have it on their statement of faith as a proof text. I put it to you, it doesn't prove their argument. But we're going to have to find seven years in here, and we're going to have to find people getting left behind. So, um, yeah, this is going to be interesting. So I like a challenge, guys. Okay. So, can, can I just give you another argument of theirs? Okay, so, at the rapture, they say Jesus is coming uh, for his saints. Okay, for, F-O-R. And they say, for the third coming, Jesus is coming with. Okay, with his saints. So, this year... He's coming for us, the church, taking us up. And then seven years later, he's coming with. I put it to you in the passage we're about to read. It's actually going to tell us that he's coming for and with at the one time. So that's all going to happen at the one time. So I want you guys to judge it. You guys are pretty smart. So, um, McKenna, would you read from, um, because I, I'm not skipping in for the sake of it, but... Um, this I know their arguments, so let's start at First Thessalonians four, verse thirteen, and just keep reading into chapter five. But we do not want you to be uniformed brothers about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as those who are asleep, but you Now, can you see he's, he's coming with, with his saints? So that's supposed to happen seven years later. Okay, so underline with there. 
So he's coming with. Is he coming for as well? Keep reading. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with his words. Okay, can you see that he's coming for his saints as well? He's not just coming with them, he's coming for them all at the one time. Keep reading, there's no chapters in the original Greek. Hmm. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourself are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. They will what? They will not escape. Say that once more. They will not escape. Okay, so just in that verse there, have a look what happens. Is it a gradual judgment or is it sudden? Okay, sudden and how, how does it work out for the wicked? Do the wicked escape? Is there any space for the wicked escaping? Is there any seven year tribulation mentioned here? <coughs> now, um, you can read on a few verses just to, so we have full context here. Read down to verse 9. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you, <coughs> for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so guys, this is one of their main proof texts. Can anybody show me where the seven-year tribulation is here? Can so somebody tell me how anybody survives this? I mean, be honest. You guys are, are smart. Um, you can think for yourself. Um, the question is, is this climatic or is this just a b blip on the radar of time? What do you think? I mean, can you, can anybody see survivors here? Um, I put it to you, this is the end. Mm -hmm. This is the end. And they put this in their statements of faith as if it's like, oh, here, this, this proves pre-trib. Does it, the question is, you guys can think for yourself, is it teaching what they're, they're teaching? Huh? Or is this the end? Does this look like it's the end? Does anybody escape? So if nobody escapes, how are they going to fill their seven-year tribulation with all these wicked people? So, saying it's mentioned thief in the night, can we go to Second Peter 3? I need you guys to help me again and tell me how anybody survives this. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, with the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing, that, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, then what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversations and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heaven shall, the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Okay. How does that look? 
would you like to be left on earth whenever this is happening? No, it's, it's pretty detrimental. <laughs> Guys, I put it to you that, that this, when Jesus comes, this earth is going to be burnt up. The wicked are going to be burnt up. If they are not caught up to meet Jesus in the air, they're finished. There's no survivors here. And the other thing is, it, it talks about this day of him coming as a thief. But tell me this. Here's the question. He mentions it. New heavens, new earth. Okay. What comes after this destruction comes down? Um, is it the new heavens and new earth? Or is it a seven year tribulation followed by a thousand years followed by new heavens and new earth? What does it say in that passage? What do we look for? New heavens and new earth. The last verse there says, it talks about all the destruction that's coming, and it, but it's basically saying, don't worry, because we're looking for the new heavens and the new earth. Mm -hmm. Do doesn't, it, you understand that it's, it's talking about the end whenever he's going to bring in eternity here and he's going to regenerate this earth. So again, so far anyway, to me, already you should be seeing a pattern that when Jesus comes, it's the end. Yeah. It's finito. But I'd like us to go, and, and then we can leave it open for another question. Yeah. Could we go to uh, Luke chapter 17? And we'll start at verse 26. Vanessa, would you read this? And by the way, this is Jesus talking about the end. So uh, let, let's see what he has to say. And as it was in the days of Noah, Noah. Noah so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that no, 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 no. no one <laughs> entered in the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Destroyed how many? Destroyed them all. Destroyed how many? Them all. Okay, keep going. <laughs> Likewise, also it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Destroyed what? Them all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Okay. Guys, here's a couple of examples. So Jesus is saying, if you want to know what the coming of the Lord's like, he says, he gives two examples, Noah's day and also Sodom. Okay, he talks about the city of Sodom. How was the world destroyed in Noah's day? Flood. Was there any survivors who weren't in the ark? Okay. Everybody that had the breath of, of air in their lungs was destroyed. In Sodom, okay, so God always brings his people out first, rescues them. Okay, so he brought his people into the ark, protected them, then he destroyed the wicked. What did he do in Sodom and Gomorrah? Did he leave his people in there? How many people survived the fire in Sodom and Gomorrah? Anybody know? Many survivors? You're allowed to have a guess. One. Right, we've got one here. Anybody agree? I was going to say five, but now that I'm thinking. Okay, we've got five, we've got one. Did you say four? No, it's no. Some, you say three? I would say three. Three is correct. Who were the three people that survived? Lot. Lot. His two daughters. His two daughters? Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody it's nearly made it. His wife. That's why I was going to say four. She, so she okay. came out, but then she turned around. And yeah. Turned around. yeah. But she, she didn't make it. She So she was... They, this is the way preachers say... She came out of Sodom, but Sodom didn't come out of her. Cause, uh, and the, also the story is, it's a dangerous thing to look back. Mm. Don't look back. Whenever you're moving with God, if he says move forward, don't look back. Um, and he, he actually says, um, somewhere in the gospel, he says, remember Lot's wife. Yes. Basically warning people, don't look back. So, in both those situations, how many of the wicked were destroyed in that scenario? Okay, so how do we get survivors? Jesus is saying it's going to be like that there. And he emphasizes destroyed them all. 
and said the same day, the actual same day that Lot came out, so shall it be in the day of the appearing of the Son of Man. So, I put it to you that already there's a picture being portrayed here that is totally the opposite to pre-trib. There's no survivors here. Um, and I think it's crystal clear. But anybody else got a uh, question tonight? Because I, I really do want to leave it open for any questions. Go ahead, bro. It might just be my Bible translation, but if you keep reading <laughs> that one, it, it talks about it. it says there will be one, there will be two in one bed, yep. one will be taken, the other left. Yes. There will be two women grinding together, one will be taken, and the other left. Yes. And said to him, where Lord, he said to them. So it, to me, it sounds like <laughs> Roger. <laughs> so explain that so I know where you're coming from. Well, to me, it sounds like there's, there's going to be people survive it. That's like what it sounds right. like. It sounds like there's going to be people left. But, but the land. They, they are left, but they're left for what? Oh, for, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so the thing is, what happens is we're caught up in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says in a twinkling of an eye, which is 1 20th of a second. So we're caught up, we're rescued. We're brought to the ark, Christ, the ark. But they're left behind, but they're left behind for one, for one purpose. Um, and by the way, it, it goes on to say there, um, wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. And it's talking about the, e the eagles, the feast on the dead. Okay. So will they not be judged then? If well, brought up and judged? Or well, just well, they will, but the, 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 you have to remember what happens first is, because it all happens, it can happen within seconds. But So we're rescued in one twentieth of a second, the twinkle of an eye. Um, and if you want, want to look at that passage, I can show you. So we're rescued, but th they're obviously left behind because there's other passages that they, they, uh, they see him and they crowd for the rocks to fall on them, to, to hide from his very presence, from his glory. So, um, so they're left behind, but they're left behind for destruction. Just like in Sodom. In Sodom and Gomorrah, they brought them out. There was people left behind, but what were they left behind for? Destruction. In Noah's day, they, they were, God's people were brought out first and they were into the ark. And then the next thing is, there was people left behind, but they were left behind just to be destroyed. So, you know, there's nowhere in any of these passages you'll find a seven year, there's going to be seven years then of people r running about, feeling, continuing on, sleeping around, homosexuality, all that stuff. It's the end. Um, mm -hmm. Have you a question? Can they just like make up in seven years? Like, so they know. Yeah, how do they get this? Okay, so I'm going to take you to another passage. Okay, so let's go to Daniel 9. See, they have to find nine years somewhere, and they go into the Old Testament to a passage that has actually been fulfilled, has been fulfilled 2,000 years ago. Just to explain, because all the views agree on this, the 70 weeks really means 77s or 490 years. All the views agree with that. So amillennialists, pre-tribbers, everybody agrees. So I could kind of... Okay, so... Oh, sorry. Daniel 9, verse 24. Because I want to actually explain, because this can be complicated, but all the views... Um, I kind of agree on the numbers, but then when it gets to the last week, um, they kind of start to go in different directions. Has anybody ever talked to anybody from another church about end times and, and heard any of these views? Huh? What's, what's your experience, girls? Do, do, do people go into detail or are they passionate about it? Or Esther, have you, have you, are, do people try and push it? Do they get very bold in teaching it, or if you question it, they get defensive? Really? Hmm. Because I know it's it's definitely a popular view in America, but honestly, guys, if you know your scriptures, mm -hmm. honestly, within five minutes, you could you could actually defeat a pastor in, in his arguments. Go ahead. My dad was accused of dividing the church. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. It didn't make any sense. It was a private meeting he had with the pastor. Well, I remember talking. I remember talking to your daddy in Decatur before he passed away on this subject, and he this is what he said. He says, 
I agree with you. And at that time, your mummy, your mummy was struggling with it. And he says, he says, well, Christine doesn't agree with me on this. <laughs> but I watched how your mummy suddenly like, like, it's like, wow. She, and she just got it, you know, but I mean, it, it, it is a very popular view. So you guys need to know your scriptures. But you only need to know three or four scriptures to demolish it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even use their own passages. So we need to go to this pas passage tonight. Starting in verse 24 through to the end. Megan, do you want to read that? And while well, I'm doing my little numbers here. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks were determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconcilia reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in ever, everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the con consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay, guys, th this is this can be complicated if we don't um, move. Remember, this is their proof text. So this is, I mean, this is the Old Testament. I put it to you guys. This is, um, so let me explain the, the weeks. Okay, so th this, this is the 70 weeks. The 70 weeks is like split into three. But this is 77s, which equals 490. So seven weeks is 490 years. Are you with me? You just multiply this by seven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when it says, um, okay, when it says 70 weeks are in verse 24, 70 weeks means it's 70 heptads or 77s. Okay, so thankfully everybody agrees with this. It's just more complicated for us who don't, don't know Hebrew. So it's, it's heptad. So this year it's 70 weeks or 70 sevens. So you've got a seven, a 62, and a one, which equal 70 weeks. So it's split, split up like that there. So this is 49 years, 434, and then seven. The good news about this passage is this is one of the, the number one proof texts to prove that Jesus is a Messiah. This is talking about the Messiah. This is talking about back in Daniel's day. It says that in this amount of years, somewhere in here, Jesus is going to be born. The Messiah is going to come. So this is a proof to the Jews that the Messiah has already come. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try and break it down now just to see what it's saying here. So, um, so what is actually predicting here? So it, it says 70 weeks or 490 years are determined upon thy people, the holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision, and to anoint the most holy. All the theologians always believe that this is talking about the Messiah, the coming of Jesus, and the cross. And him, Jesus was righteousness, would you agree? And the righteousness that he brought was everlasting righteousness. So the, the classic view was always up until 1830 was this is historically already fulfilled. Okay, so it goes on then to give us more meat on the bones. And it says, know therefore and understand that going, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Three, three score is what's a score? What what's what's one score? Twenty. So three score is sixty years. Okay. So does anybody have a version that brings it in the modern uh, terminologies? Read read twenty five. Then you know therefore and understand that. 
coming out with words or stories of Jerusalem. They come in and then when people have friends, they should be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, it should be built again in squares. But in trouble time, and after the 62 weeks, the anointed one should be cut off and shall have done. Okay, guys, let me just do the map here. This should help it. Okay, there's two markers here. The first one's like 49, and then there's one at the end. So what happens in this first part is the city is rebuilt. Okay, so in here the city's rebuilt, that's the first marker. Then after that, um, you have the next marker which comes right to the uh, 7 plus 62. So between the 69th, so, so I'll put halfway there because it's going to be important here for us to realize because this is what happened after at this year was the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry. Okay? Halfway through it, he was cut off for our sins. Okay? So can somebody re can you read on from that verse you just read there? So it talks about the seven and the sixty-nine, which comes to does it does it say the seven and the sixty-two there? In that verse? In that verse you just read. Okay, so that would you agree that comes to 69? Okay, so um, this plus this is this amount of years. So you're t let's put a plus sign in here. So we, whenever you see the 7 plus the 62, that comes to 69, okay, which just leaves that last week there. So do you want to read on from that verse just to see what's happening here? Starting like 26? Yeah. And after the 62 weeks, the anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. It, its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. The relations are decreed. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. For half of the week he shall put an end to the sacrifice and offering. Um, between the abominations shall come one who makes desolate until decreed and and okay, if you see in the last week there, okay, that um, that he shall cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. Um, the typical historic view is that, that that's the cross. That's where the curtain was ripped in two. Okay? Halfway through the last week, that's where the, he made an end for sin. So that if you look at the, the passages pointing to the Messiah. By the way, the Messiah's already come. Yeah. The Messiah's come 2,000 years ago. Oh, yeah. This is a historic passage. This is nothing to do with the second coming. There's nothing in there. This is to do with what happened at Calvary. And guess what? Does anybody know how many years Christ's earthly ministry was? Three and a half years. Oh, surprise, yeah. surprise. So, like... Messiah is going to begin his ministry here in the 69th week. Halfway through that week, he makes a covenant for many by giving his own life. And he forfeited his life right at the halfway through that last week. This here is one of the most potent passages that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's already come. What the pre-tribbers do is they cut the last week off here and they relate what in there relates to to Christ, they related to Antichrist, and they say that. The, so they cut this off, and they propel it into the unknown, two thousand years plus. In fact, we're in two thousand and twenty. Okay, so they they just they they propel this last week. They cut it off, decapitate it, and they throw it into the future to some unknown time. And they say that that is our seven-year tribulation. And halfway through that week, um, Antichrist is going to make a covenant. And so they apply what re relates to the new covenant. They relate it not just to Christ, but to Antichrist. But this passage is talking about the coming of Messiah, not the coming of Antichrist. No. So this is one of their proof texts. So, could we read it again in the light of what I'm talking about here, just in case somebody's got a question? Uh, Megan, do you want to read that again? Just 
it, and they'll just because it's a pretty complex passage. Uh, 24. Yeah, from verse 24 on. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity. Do you think Antichrist can do that? No. no. Huh? Like, it's, uh, that's ridiculous that they would apply this to Antichrist. This has got Jesus written all over it. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. Could, he, could Antichrist do that? No. Mm -hmm. Ever? No. And to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the, the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation uh -huh. to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay, and that last, you see that last verse there, it's saying because they kept on having their animal sacrifices, he was going to destroy their temple. Mm -hmm. He says because of the overspreading of abominations, so th that didn't have to happen within the 70 weeks, but that was a result of what happened in the 70 weeks. Yeah. They were, their temple was going to be destroyed. There is nothing here to, to support a pre-trib thing. And for them to relate this year to Antichrist, to me, is pretty grievous. So that whole section, they actually apply to Antichrist, that whole thing we just read? Yes. Yeah, it's very confusing. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, this is one of their proof texts, that we can go to loads of, hundreds of clear texts to prove what we believe. But this is one of their... Proof text, and it's absolutely nothing to do with what they're saying. This is, it didn't, it's not even future tense. This has already happened in history. I mean, so right up until the 1830s, this was a given that, um, that this has already been fulfilled. This proves the Messiah has come. Is there uh, any Old Testament that actually talks about that is a prophecy of anything that's happening in the New Testament or now? Is there any prophecies of, yeah, like of the coming of the Lord? Yeah, are the, are the Old Testament prophecies are they closed in the sense that it's all predicting like Jesus coming and the temple being destroyed? Is there anything that relates to now? Any, any prophecies that relate in the Old Testament to today? Well, that's a good question. They keep doing that. So I'm just wondering. And by the way, I mean, I can go there now if. Um, but, guys, I, I can also, if you still aren't convinced with the pre trib, because this is their past. This is their verse. This is the one they use to support because we don't use it because we, this, as far as I'm concerned, this isn't a second common passage. So we, we're, this is their passage and it's historic. It's already been fulfilled. The other thing is earlier in Daniel 9, it talks about 70 years that the children of Israel would be in Babylon. Now, would you think of cutting up that 70 years. If, if somebody said, in seven days this is going to happen, would you even think of splitting that seven days up, like uh, splitting it up? And Well, there's 70 years in there, and nobody would think of splitting that 70 years up in time. So why would we split this 70 weeks up? Like, cut it up and say, oh, that last seven years will do right at the end, because it fits our theology. It doesn't make sense. Because it, whenever Jesus says 70 weeks, 70 days, 70 years, we take it as sequential and harmonious, which means like year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. So w that would be a major objection is what authority do we have to cut the last, the last week off and just throw it into the unknown, into the invisible? Yeah, I think it's interesting too because you, it's also describing an, an event like you, like you were just saying. Like if you just read it, it actually it, it can't pertain to what they're saying. It pertains to just we don't we don't I don't think we do a very good job with context though today anymore. Yeah. We have a, we have a hard time of just listening to somebody and accepting it 
without doing our own research into it. And that, that's why tonight is as much about provoking you guys to study this subject, because it's big. And there's no other subject, well, there is other subjects that there's great confusion on, but this is one of the big ones. And this is the greatest event that's com a coming, and surely we should know what to expect. I mean, we, we shouldn't, this shouldn't be vague or, like, it doesn't matter. Like that's, well, nobody can understand Revelation, so let's, well, hello, it's there for us to understand. Um, I, want to, I want to give one more passage uh, on their argument, and it might be in there. Is, it, it, check is Revelation 4, 1 in there, or Revelation 4 to 19. They just have uh, Acts 1, 9 to 11, and the Thessalonians, that's all they've got. Okay, so let's, let's, this is their, one of their big ones in Revelation. Revelation 4, 1. Just look up for one second, guys. So, the, the, so that what they believe is the whole book of Revelation is chronological. What does chronological mean? Time goes on. Time. So it, it literally, in time, Revelation 1, 2, it's time unfolding. So they say Revelation 1 to 4 is seven church ages. Revelation 4, 1 is a rapture. Revelation 4 to 19 is the seven-year tribulation period. Do you know the only problem with this year being the seven-year trip? If you take a calculator and add all the years and hours and days, guess how many years this comes to? Like about 19 years and like three months or something like that. Oh. Because I did it one day. I'm like, okay, look, I'm going to add all the months and the years. And like, that's how bored I got at times whenever I was living in Ireland. So this is their seven-year tribulation, and this then comes the millennium, which is... Revelation is not chronological, it's, but I can prove that to you if you want. But um, I want us to look at Revelation 4.1 and tell me, is this the rapture of the church? Can somebody read Revelation 4.1 and maybe... I'll read it. Okay, go ahead. Um, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying... Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Okay, so what, what they say is that up, up until... Revelation 4 is the church ages that we're living in now. This here is the rapture of the church. But is this the church been raptured or is this John been caught up in the spirit? You don't need to guess. It's actually going to tell you. Who, who's this talking to? Who's getting caught up and what's happening here? John is actually caught up in the spirit to receive what the book, what what more revelation here so there's nothing here that, about the church being caught up would you agree guys Re read those few verses there just into yourself and so John's getting caught up in the spirit 2,000 years ago this is not the end you say in the, in the eye yeah yeah but 2,000 years ago John is getting caught up in the spirit immediately I was in the spirit So he was getting invited to come up to heaven and I will show you things which must be hereafter. So he's getting a revelation of other stuff that's going to happen here. Am I right or wrong on that? I mean, judge for yourself. So the seven-year tribulation, if you add all the years, there's not, no seven-year tribulation here because that's... And, but... If this is a seven-year tribulation, let's go to Revelation 10. I put it to you that there's like, it just keeps recapping itself. So if this is the, mid, the middle of the tribulation, to me, here's, an, here's another coming of the Lord. This is more like a coming of the Lord here. Riker, would you read this um, from Revelation 10, 1 down to verse 7? And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with the cloud. And a rainbow was upon his head, and his 
face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, the left foot on the earth. He cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which, which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that there, there is in are, and the earth and the things that are therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as, hath, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Okay, is this not the end? If this is the middle of their tribulation, then this is the end. Time shall be no longer. Or uh, a lot of the versions say, new, new versions say, delay shall be no longer, which is terrible translation. Um, it's the word chronos. Chronos, which we get chronological from. Chronos is time. But the modern versions, to, to support the false doctrine today, they've changed the word time to delay. Delay shall be no more. Like as if it's just like a blip. But the, the Greek word is chronos, time shall be no more. No more chronology, no more times, no more seasons. Um, and uh, by the way, the mystery of God's finished here. In the middle of their, halfway through their tribulation. That, um, right, Riker, could you go on then to the next chapter 11 and verse, this is still the same seventh angel, verse 15 down till verse 19. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of the Lord, and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces, and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come in thy time of the dead, and they should be judged that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants and the prophets and to the saints and them that fear thy name shall and great, small and great and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth hmm. and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were like lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail okay I put it to you this is the end this is the seventh trumpet this is the last trumpet so can you see this is like halfway through their tribulation and time shall be no more. The mystery of God's finished. You've got the judgment of the righteous and the wicked here in verse 18. Um, the kingdoms of, of this world have now become the kingdoms of our Lord in verse 15. Mm -hmm. So like this is the end. So w what I'm saying to you is every way you look at this here, it seems like when Jesus comes, that's it. It's finito. It's over. There's no survivors. Um, anybody else got any questions? Because I just don't want to... I know this is deep stuff tonight, and maybe it might be the first time you've ever heard it from this perspective, so it might be overwhelming. But anybody, any more questions or thoughts? Um, so do uh, both views, do they uh, mean the share like, the same uh, like signs of the end times? Or like, do they have like different variations? Good, good question. I'll, okay, a lot of the pre-trib believe that the signs of the time come after we disappear. So, uh, the view, the view, uh, the main view over the years is that there is going to be a lot of signs of the coming of the Lord. There's going to be things are going to be going downhill big time at the end. There's going to be a persecution of the church. So they believe the persecution happens after after we disappear which is handy there's like books in walmart how to survive the tribulation period as if when jesus comes you're gonna like like jimmy's gonna be running about going hey where's my mate billy billy hasn't been about and he can go to walmart and buy this book and survive for seven years and then make the third coming but it doesn't make sense because first of all the bible doesn't say that and what they say is their proof text doesn't actually prove anything. 
And so every passage that you look at, I put it to you, the coming of the Lord is the end. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Guys, literally, I could do a 50-week series on this here. So I'm tr trying to condense 50 weeks <coughs> into one week. You get, you're getting about you know, 2% there. I know, I know. <laughs> Jaleesa, could you read 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 22? For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he should. Think about this, guys. It's, it talks about the coming of the Lord, and what does it say immediately after that? Then cometh the end. Keep going. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have to down all rule and all authority and power. Okay, so here you have it again. You've got the coming of the Lord, which is said to be the end, where his kingdom is delivered up to, him, to his father, and he will have put down all rule and all authority and power. It's the end. How do you survive that? It's final. Yeah. Would you want to miss the boat? No. <laughs> also, can you explain? You say miss the boat all the time. Can you explain? Okay. Well, miss the boat because for years, preachers will talk about the coming of the Lord in the context of like Noah's Noah's day. Those that were made the ark were safe. They look upon the ark as a picture of Christ. So when they, they talk about missing the boat is people are either in Christ and they're secure or else they're outside of Christ. And when he comes, the trumpet goes, you miss the boat. It's too late. Um, in fact, just on that, let's go to Matthew 25 because it's, it kind of talks about they're banging on the door trying to get in, but it's too late. Kyler, do you want to read Matthew 25, 1 through 13? The kingdom of heaven would be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. When the wise took glasses of oil with their lamps. And the bridegroom was made, and they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight they cried, Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins who rose and rimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. The wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, but rather do the, the dealers abide for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the, buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. The door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Okay. That's talking about the coming of the Lord. But it talks about the door being shut, okay, which, um, by the way, do you know that Noah didn't close the door of the ark? Do you know that? Who closed it? God closed the door. And when God closes the door, so that terminology basically comes when, when Christ comes, who is our ark, our place of protection, our safety, if people miss the boat, they're going to be destroyed. But, you know, there is scripture that intimates very similar language that once the door is closed, that's it. So when the trumpet goes, we're caught up, we're rescued. And just like in Sodom, just like in Noah's day, once we're rescued, that's the first thing that happens. He always rescues his people first. The second thing is he destroys all the wicked. And there's going to be no survivors, in my opinion, according to what we read here. Any more questions or any more scriptures you want me to look at? Because there's a multitude of scripture that says the same thing. Go ahead. Which one is it? Acts 1, 9. Yeah, I, I do a one thing, I'm not sure. Acts yeah, one thing. To be honest, I'm... 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I know what their argument is here. This is for their third coming. Okay. You guys, I'll, I'll tell you something. They get confused because it's so... Like, what's the, fir what's, the fir what's the second coming? What's the third coming? And then what's, what's the tribulation? What's the millennium? What's in the new heavens, new earth? And they get confused. But, um, okay, they're talking about this is when he comes with his saints, okay? And, but, but this is after he left. They're talking about the way that he left is the way that he's coming back, which is right. But they, they take it somewhere it's not meant to go. Would you read that, McKenna, from verse 9 through to verse 11? And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go down. Okay, so this is what they say. They interpret this as if the way that he left earth is the way that he's returning to earth. Is that what it's saying? No. It's saying the way that he went into heaven is the way that he's coming from heaven. Can you see heaven, heaven, heaven is mentioned here about four or five times? They, they actually make it say the opposite. So what they say is the same way that he left earth is the way that he's coming back to earth. So he left the Mount of Olives. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. But w read it again in the light of that. And tell me, is it talking about the way he left earth or the way he went into heaven the way he's coming out of heaven? And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? So where were they looking, to earth or to heaven? Yeah. Keep going. This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Okay. So is it talking about the way he went into heaven or the way he left the earth? Guys, the reason I'm saying this, don't think I'm being pernickety here, but they use this as a main argument that this is proof that this is not the rapture. They say, oh, here's, this is proof that he's coming to earth. Well, the, it's actually talking about the way that he went into heaven on a cloud is the way that he's coming back again on a cloud. That's what it's saying. Nothing more. And that's also where they get the whole Zechariah and that book or whatever. Yeah. They started thinking. They yep. steal all the whole details of how supposedly about the physical man of all Go ahead, Kyler. What, what was the third point for this? Because to me, it just sounds like he's going to come back. Exactly. So I don't, I don't understand what their third point is. Well, okay, so what you have to remember is because the Bible doesn't teach two future comments, they have to twist scripture to make it look like there's going to be. They, they have to, okay, this is what they have to do. They have to make the rapture look completely different to the third coming. So they tell you, well, he's coming for his saints here and he's coming with them here. This he's coming to the sky. This he's coming to earth. So they use that as proof that he's coming to earth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, this has to be different from his. But that passage there is not saying what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So it's a main argument for them, but it's not a main argument for us because we're like, hello, he says he went, he went up in a cloud and there's many scriptures say that he's coming in a cloud. Yeah. That's all it's telling us. Yeah. The, way, the way he went into heaven is the way that he's coming from heaven. Nothing more. To force anything extra into that is just trying to make a scripture say what you want it to say. So, but By the way, that's... that's that is one of their passages to prove a third coming. But, but again, where's their seven-year tribulation? They, they, that, that, that passage that we looked at in, in uh, Daniel has already been fulfilled 2,000 years ago. So they've got no scripture here. 
And by the way, that pastor that I talked to, um, I didn't get finished my story in uh, stir fry. He ended up walking away. Halfway through the meal, he just stood up and he walked out and he never come back. Well, he had, guess where he was the next Sunday? Guess whose church he was in? He was here. He's like, that guy had no arguments to this here because when if you know your scriptures, there's nothing they can say because their scriptures aren't saying what they're saying. It's simply not there. It's not in re Revelation. And I say the reason why I've spent 22 years of my life studying this subject, and I have loads of books probably written on so many subjects, is because there's so much ignorance and deception out there. And it's like, it, it really grieves me that people just swallow into that and they don't even question it. Well, my because question is like, why did it, oh, sorry. Because it, it gives like people like a false, like not a false hope, but like they think that they can just, oh, you know, I can live like the devil and then, uh -huh. oh, well, I'll have another seven years yeah. to get right with the Lord. Yeah. You know, it's just. It's not going to happen. No. Why do they think they're so defensive about it too? I mean, I mean, one of the one of the things I can see is that, that they don't have an argument, so they get frustrated. But it seems that almost every single one that we've ran into, generally, are really very defensive about the whole pre-trib, right? Pre-trib, yeah. Oh, they're this very because if you dare to question it, you'll probably end up turning from it. But so they don't want you to question it because once you question it, you'll probably come to the conclusion we're coming to tonight. Which is weird because doesn't that mean they also kind of know that it's not true when they do that? Yes. Oh, you see, okay. Well, let's be honest. Whenever you know the truth, you can leave it open for other people to express their opinions. Because you're confident, well, this is what the book says. But the, the other thing is they don't even quote the passages because if they did quote the passages, they just give the references. So Because if they quote the passages, it's like, well, that doesn't say what you're saying. But I've been debating this online for 22 years, and honestly, it's so hard to get debates with pre-tribbers anymore because they're like hen's teeth. They're, everybody's moving away from pre-trib now. Your generation, you see, if you go to your grandparents' generation, if you shook, shook a bush, a pre-tribber jumped out of it, okay? But your generation have actually got social media, they've got internet, so your generation actually is allowed to ask, but why? Why do we believe that? So what's happened is, and even in, this, in the Southern Baptist Bible colleges, they're all moving away from pre-trib to this here, the amillennialism, which is when he comes, time shall be no more, it's finito, it's all over, caught up or caught on. But that is now is starting to take over again, and maybe give it another 30 years, and I think America could be, have shifted to this here. Because your generation doesn't just swallow what they're told anymore. We've been lying to for so long. <laughs> but I'm telling you, your generation is asking, but why? My generation started it. I mean, I, but, you know, I remember asking my dad, who was a pastor, I remember asking him a question when I was about 13, and he was stumped. And I'm like, okay, well, my dad knows everything, and he doesn't know this. <laughs> you know, you think your dad knows everything about the Bible, okay? Whenever you're that age. But it's like, he doesn't have a clue here. And he actually admitted that to me. And I remember whatever it was, I can't even remember the question. And I'm like, hmm. Oh. Well, if he doesn't know, nobody knows. I, because my dad was very knowledgeable. And when I didn't, you know, the last 10 years of my dad's life, I was badly backslidden. So I didn't really get to talk to him about things like this, but his best friend, Davy, who's become my best friend, uh, Davy told me, he said, no, your dad wasn't pre-trib at the end. And I know it because Davy's pre-trib. Yeah. And he said, he said, your dad definitely wasn't pre-trib. Yes. Really? Oh, hey, and I'll tell you another thing. Oh boy, you talk. I don't even need to put bait on the hook with Davy. I just need to throw the fishing hook out there and I get a bite every time. But he won't debate it with me because he. Well, because, because I push it and I push it and it's like I don't want it to affect our friendship. But um, yeah, so pre trib today is. It, it definitely is on the back foot. Your generation is allowed to ask why. 
But 30 years ago, was that allowed in churches? This, uh, well, why do we believe that? It wasn't. 30 years ago, you either believed what the pastor believed or else you were in trouble or you were a troublemaker. But thankfully today, whether you're a pre-tribber tonight or an amillennialist, whatever, in our church, it doesn't matter. But this is what we teach. And we teach it because we believe it's biblical. And the other thing is, um, I've, I've asked some of these pastors, if you're so confident, let's debate it. Okay? You get up for an hour, I'll get up for an hour. You get up for an hour, I'll get up. And let's take a Saturday. All day Saturday. I will just take one subject, and then we'll leave it open for Q&A. And then we'll go on to the next subject. Let's spend the whole day Saturday, and let's just let the people judge for themselves. But guess how many takers I've got so far? Zilch. But I, I encourage you, if you know a pastor that's really bold, believes this, just say, hey, I know a pastor who would love to debate this. Uh, not to win an argument, but because the truth matters. The truth matters. And whenever you share this to most people today, they're like, that makes sense. yep, that makes sense. Um, and like we haven't even went into all the passages of a general resurrection. See, they say that there's three resurrection days as well. I'll, I'll finish. Hey, time's beat us. Yeah. Okay. Hey, real quick. And I'll just say this. The, one of the confusing things about what they teach is there's three judgment days and there's three resurrection days as well. Only these three. Okay. Yeah, and I'll just show you. Just here. There's, okay, there's a resurrection judgment here of the church. There's a resurrection judgment here after. And then there's a resurrection of the wicked and judgment a thousand years later. So, hey, I'll leave you with that. I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't even realize the last 20 minutes disappeared. All right. Good. But if you have a question, we can answer it after. Yeah. All right. Good. All right. We'll go ahead and uh, close in prayer. Can I do a question? Oh, I was just going to say, like, so what's, like, post-trib? Yeah, well, post-trib's this, too. Th this is... Is that the same thing? As so, yeah, well, the, the post-trib is basically that the church has been in tribulation from the cross right through to the coming of the Lord. Um, so this is a trib. Okay. It's not seven years, not three and a half. The, the church has always been in tribulation. So, um, in fact, some say that it started with the martyrdom of Stephen. Stephen was the first martyr three and a half years after the cross. So, but they just the tribulation, and it's going to get it's going to get worse near the end. That's flames. It's going to get before Jesus comes. The tribulation is going to be cranked up. But another thing of this is really handy that we don't go through tribulation. We just get it easy, and the tribulations for all the everybody else. An interesting point there. Uh, we went to California. And he's half Japanese, half American. And he's like, yeah, you don't, you don't tell people in other countries, especially persecuted countries, uh, free trips real because they don't, it's so discouraging for them. You don't, know, you don't want to tell. Them. Yeah, you try telling the Chinese church that they're not in the tribulation. You t they, t t tell uh, believers in Pakistan that they're not in the tribulation period. Or North Korea. The, yeah, the, like uh, half the church today is under severe persecution. Uh, uh, you go to Iraq, Iran. Believers are losing their lives. Egypt, they're losing their lives for the gospel. And just because in America we're getting it easy doesn't mean the church isn't in tribulation. So all this year that we, we don't go through tribulation, it's not true. It's simply not true. In fact, the Bible says all that live godly in Christ shall per suffer persecution. So why has the American church not been persecuted? Because we're just, we're not standing up for the truth. But if you stand up for the truth in your schools today, guys, there will be a kickback. You will be persecuted. They'll blacken you. They'll stand against you. They'll make you out to be uh, an extremist, uh, homophobic, um, 
everything. They'll throw everything at you if you say, well, I believe the Bible. So if you don't believe we're in the tribulation, then the key is stand up and see if there's a kickback. And if you want to hear what an Irish preacher said about pre-trib, they said there's so many ends they don't tie up. <laughs> okay, this one, it said, so you've got the end of the church age, then you've got the end of the tribulation period, then you've got the end of the millennium, then you've got, and it's like there's so many ends, whereas we're here, you've just got one end, the end. So the saying is, there's so many ends, they don't tie up. Yeah. It's just a... That's, that's yeah. good. Huh? All right. Hopefully I haven't confused you guys, because, I mean, maybe men's theology we could divert over. We didn't even cover Antichrist or anything like that. Who's the Antichrist? <laughs> uh, but maybe that's for another day, but... Um, Megan, if anybody's got a question, just if they want to write it down, I'll, I'll, I can email a response. Because if, if any of you guys want me to email stuff to you, I mean, I, I've got, I have books of stuff. I mean, I have books. And we have online, like, honestly, if a pre-tribber pokes his head up, normally after two days, they disappear with their tail between the legs because everybody's like, where's your scriptures? Where's your scriptures? And then they... And then, well, that doesn't say what you're saying, and they end up just disappearing. But that's where your generation is today. Your generation wants to know the truth. Like, don't give me any nonsense. Just give me the truth. Show me. Let me see it for myself. And w that's what I do like about this generation. It, there's negatives with it, because your generation questions everything. But the positives are that just because your grandfather or your great-grandfather believed it doesn't mean you have to believe it. You have to find it for yourself. And I think that's healthy, actually. So that, you know, it means that you have to find it for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Big subject.